since I've gone off on six different rabbit trails. Let's come back to the central thing here. Please welcome Alex Newman. Thanks. So great to be here, so many beautiful people. It's just uh, an honor to be here. Thanks to Ed Griffin, Debbie Bacigalupi, Patrick Wood, uh, John Wells, everybody who made this happen. You guys are awesome. And so I want to talk to you guys about how they built the matrix in our mind to begin with. You know, how did we get to this place where Americans don't know history, Americans don't know their Bible, Americans don't know their Constitution, their Declaration of Independence, their Bill of Rights, or anything really, except you know, maybe what happened on the football game and the Kardashian house. How did we get here? Well, education, of course, or what they call education. So how many of you guys know that the government schools are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing? They're, they're not messed up, they're not broken, we can't fix them. They're doing exactly what they were designed to do. And so that's a little bit about what I'm gonna talk about today. And so to build this matrix in our mind, to make us into a dumbed down population that would be willing to accept totalitarianism, globalism, socialism, they had to start in our minds. They started in the schools, they started in kindergarten. And there's a lot of other components to it. You know, there's, there's the media, there's a lot going on here that got us here. But I think education is the key to how they did it and to how we break ourselves free. And so that's why I've focused so much on this over the last five years. I'm a teacher. Uh, I wrote this book, Crimes of the Educators, with uh, Dr. Sam Blumenfeld. Some of you guys might know him. He's you know, one of the founding fathers of the homeschool movement. Uh, he wrote 12 books on education. He did this for 50 years. He dedicated his life to saving as many people as possible, as many kids as possible, from the scourge of illiteracy. Because he knew that if kids could read, they could read their Bible, their Constitution, their history, their science. We can educate ourselves if we can read. And so that's why this is, I think, such an important subject. So, Crimes of the Educators, uh, Dr. Blumenfeld, you know, w they contacted me about this, and they said, hey, do you want to participate with this? And I knew of Dr. Blumenfeld. We both write for the New American Magazine, the JBS Magazine, posted up over there, uh, and other projects. And he worked for a long time with the JBS. And I said, wow, that would be really cool. But I hadn't read his books. I didn't know everything that he was about. I just knew he was an education guy. But I'll tell you, it was such an honor and such a pleasure and such an incredible happenstance that I did this because it probably saved my own children from huge problems to come. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. If your kids are 18, 19, they're off in college now, you wonder what happened? Why, what is wrong with the minds of my child? They can't read, they don't care about anything, they totally oppose my values, they're anti-Christian. How did that happen? Well, we're gonna go through a little bit of that story, how that happened and what we can do about it. So the premise of our book is literally that uh, crimes are being committed by the so-called education establishment. We argue in the book that it's a criminal enterprise. And now I don't mean that teachers are criminals. Right? I'm a teacher, not in a public school, but I'm a teacher. And I know lots and lots of wonderful people in the schools, constitutionalists, Christians. Uh, they all homeschool their kids, by the way, I'll add. So you know, that should tell you something right there. But the, the system itself has become a massive criminal operation. And I don't mean that figuratively. It's, it's not a hyperbole. I mean that literally. I mean these are actual crimes that should be prosecuted in a court of law. So um, I'll go through a quick list of them, and then we'll break it down as we go through the presentation. So treason, that's a really serious word, and I don't use it lightly. Uh, actually, uh, yesterday, Holly gave you guys an excellent presentation. She wrote a book called Training for Treason. This is serious stuff. This is not hyperbole. This is literally treason, and you'll, you'll understand why I say that as we move through here. And I'm not the only one to come to this conclusion. In fact, we'll get to President Reagan's commission in a minute, but they came to some very interesting conclusions about this. Child abuse. We argue that deliberately dumbing down a child is criminal. That's abuse of a child. I mean, they're destroying these kids mentally, physically, and spiritually. So this is a crime of massive proportions, and uh, we can't just let it keep happening. Contributing to the delinquency of a minor. You know, people would be shocked to see how much pornography, how much drug stuff, how much sick values are coming through these schools into the minds of our children. And we consider that to be a very serious crime. And you know, you can check in any state, you'll have a statute against contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Encouraging kids to do drugs, promiscuous sex, take abortions, all the rest of it, that is contributing to the delinquency of a minor. So destroying children's belief in biblical religion. I mean, this is literally one of the main functions of the government schools today. People think that's shocking. 
go read what the founders of the modern education system wrote. And we'll go through some of that. This is what they designed it to do. They didn't want Americans to be Christian. They didn't want Americans to be moral people, to believe in the Ten Commandments. And so they deliberately set out to undermine that, and they're doing it all day, every day, in every government school across this country. And uh, there, yes, there's good people in the schools, but they can't buck the system, or they'll be fired. They'll be removed from their position. Drug pushing. You know, I, I was talking to a mom earlier. They tried to diagnose her seven-year-old kid with ADD and fill him up with amphetamines. What? Are you kidding me? I mean, that destroys the mind of the child. It's going to create a zombie-like child. It's going to beat the love of learning out of the child. And he never had a problem to begin with, except maybe what the government schools did to him. So we don't need to be pushing drugs on our children. We need to be providing them the tools so that they can educate themselves. And then finally, fraud and extortion. If a businessman came to you and said, hey, I have this product that'll do you know, such and such, and you bought the product and it did the opposite, well, you'd be pretty mad, right? You'd probably take him to court. You'd say, that was fraudulent. You told me it was going to do this. It did the opposite. Well, that's exactly what's happened with the government schools. They say, give us your tax money, give us your children, uh, you know, and we'll educate the children. And rather than educate the children, they dumb down the children, they indoctrinate the children, and it literally now threatens the future of our republic and our liberties. And it's not hyperbole. I don't mean that figuratively. Uh, I mean that literally. So uh, I'm, again, I know I'm not the first one to come to this conclusion. I want to point you to this report. This is from 1983. The situation is so much worse now than it was then. But this was Ronald Reagan's commission, uh, the Commission uh, for Excellence in Education. They said that if an unfriendly foreign power had imposed this system on us, we might have considered it an act of war. That's really serious language from some bureaucrats, right, from people on a government commission. They don't normally talk like that. So if domestic people did it, is it any less an act of war? Well, no, right? It's, it's just treason. Uh, and then we have the educational foundations of our society are presently being eroded by a rising tide of mediocrity. And this is the important part. It threatens our very future as a nation and as a people. So take that to heart, guys. This is a threat to our future as a nation and as a people. If we mess this up, it's all over. So, you know, there's lots of important issues and we, you know, we need to be involved all across the board. We all have a duty to do that. But if this one, if we mess it up, Say goodbye to our nation, say goodbye to our people, say goodbye to our liberties, it's over, right? So that's how important this is. That's why I dedicate so much of my time to education. And uh, that's why I'm so honored to be here and have the opportunity to speak to you guys. So, you know, I often use the war metaphor. Uh, you know, I say there's a war on America, there's a war on the church, there's a war on liberty, there's a war on humanity as a whole. A lot of humanity has already fallen victim to this, you know? Look at what happened in uh, communist China. Look at what happened in the Soviet Union. Look at what happened in Nazi Germany. There are maniacs, totalitarians, and psychopaths who would kill and enslave you in a second without one thought of remorse. So that's the stakes that we're dealing with here. Now, 99.9% .9 of people have never heard of this, but there's a thing called the Janissary. Uh, so the Ottoman Empire, way back in the day, they, uh, the Islamic Empire, they would run raids into Christian Europe and they would kidnap Christian children. And they would take them back to the Ottoman Empire, they would brainwash them, they would turn them into Muslims, and then they would turn them into an elite core of military people. And then they would send them back into Europe, they knew the language, they knew the culture, they knew the people, and they would wreak total havoc. So what I submit to you is that these schools are creating future janissaries. The difference, and it's a big difference, back then the Ottoman Empire had to go kidnap the children. We now send them voluntarily. So these children are being turned against us. You know, if some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you have a kid in college, if you have a 16-year-old, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They hate your values. They hate your church. They hate the Constitution, those racist white men who started America, right? So where do you think this is coming from? They are turning our children into janissaries for a war on the American people. So it's uh, serious business. Um, and, you know, I, I like humor in presentations, but this is just such a serious topic, so you'll have to forgive me. Uh, it's hard to make this funny. You know, it's, it's, it's our lives on the line, it's our country on the line, it's our liberty on the line. But um, in early America, literacy was really, really widespread. And I've done huge amounts of research on this. There's a million sources that confirm it. Uh, John Adams wrote that a native of America who can't read and write is as rare as a comet or an earthquake. So did you guys see comets a lot? Not really, right? So it was rare that an American couldn't read or write. And this was hundreds of years ago, long before we spent a trillion dollars on so-called government education. Jefferson used to brag that U.S. farmers were the only ones in the world who read Homer. You know, ask a kid today about Homer, see what they tell you. Don't! 
right? <laughs> That's where we're at today. This was hundreds of years ago. And they didn't have this education bureaucracy. How could they have been so educated? If you look at the statistics on literacy, it's just incredible how many people could read. You know, if you look uh, all the way to the 1800s, uh, women and men could read. If you look uh, at the national education in the United States, th there's so much data out there that supports the fact that Americans were almost universally literate. I mean, it was one in a thousand who couldn't read and write properly. And I mean, the, the evidence of this is overwhelming. And now I want to just go through um, quickly uh, some of the stuff that we have today in terms of data on reading from the Civil War. See, so the, the literacy was, uh, you know, spread all the way into the 1800s. 90% uh, of the Union soldiers, 80% of the Confederate soldiers could read. And now, today's America, in 1993, this was a study from the U.S. Department of Education, they found that 55% of Americans could either not read at all or could barely read. I mean, these are functionally literate. They maybe can read a stop sign but they're not going to crack open the Constitution or the Bible or a history book or you know, any of the things that they need to be learning. If you look in uh, 2003, the nation's report card found that 50% of Americans are barely literate. If you look in Washington, D.C., the state education agency concluded that more than two-thirds of Washington, D.C. residents over the age of 15 were functionally illiterate. So they have 15, 16, 17, 18 thousand dollars a year for each kid for 12 years and these kids are graduating and they can't read their high school diploma. Does anybody think that's an accident? I mean, do we have a bunch of total morons in Washington, D.C. who don't know anything? You know, uh, Robert uh, earlier said that some of them are dumb. Yeah, that's fine. But they're not this dumb, right? I mean, kids could read 200 years ago without any of this bureaucracy. This is 100% deliberate. And I'm going to show you guys how they did it. Uh, this is not my discovery. This has actually been known since the 1840s. But uh, it's been very, very carefully hidden and suppressed. And Sam Blumenfeld actually did a lot of the research to figure out where all this came from, how it happened, how we got to this point, and how we fix it. So that's the good news. We can fix this. You know, again, if you just look through the statistics today, it's absolutely disastrous. I could talk for a week about the statistics. Americans are getting dumber quicker. To the point now where, I mean, if you just use SATs as a metric, they keep dumbing them down every 10 years to conceal the scope of how quickly we're being dumbed down. But the smart kids today are dumber than the dumb kids in the 1950s and the 60s. And you can show all this objectively. So a lot of you guys went to school in the 50s, 60s, maybe even the 70s, and you think, well, it wasn't that bad. You know, maybe I got some propaganda, you know, but it wasn't that bad. Well, it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse, and it's going to keep getting worse unless and until somebody stands up and says, no more and, uh, you know, we take care of this problem, and we must take care of the problem. Remember how serious the stakes are. So here's the government spending. You know, they say, oh, if we just give us more money, then we'll solve the problem, right? So there's the federal spending on education. That's the blue line. Uh, the others are the scores in literacy and math and all that. So that's not going to solve the problem, right? Baltimore, uh, I just wrote a couple days ago, they, they had six schools in Baltimore. They couldn't produce one single student who was proficient in either English or math. So let that sink in. They have $16,000 every year for every kid, and they can't produce one student out of the whole school who could be proficient in math or in English. And you think, oh, well, that's not in my district. We have a good school in my district. No, you don't. This problem is national. Some are a little bit worse than others. The dumbing down is a little bit worse than some than others. Sometimes there's conscientious teachers who do what they can to uh, help the kids out. But this is a national problem. And actually, I'll show it's, it's a global problem, too. This is gentleman uh, up on the screen is Horace Mann. He is the guy who introduced this whole concept of you know, mass government schooling that we have today. He brought it over from Prussia. He, uh, he, he was a Unitarian. He wanted to kind of get Christ out of the schools and have it stop being sectarian in his words. But he really liked this idea in Prussia where you have the government schools training up obedient statist citizens. So they segregated them by age and they said, well, you need to know this and this and this and that's what you're going to learn. So he brought this idea over to the United States. He was actually appointed the, uh, the Commissioner of Education in Massachusetts. It was the first time a state actually had a Commissioner of Education. And he oversaw some very interesting experiments. So I would argue that a lot of this goes back to Horace Mann. But we're going to focus more on John Dewey uh, with a quick detour. And I'll keep coming back to this, this whole word versus phonics, because this is the root of the literacy crisis. And uh, it's so important that people understand this. So 
during Horace Mann's era, he was overseeing the schools in Boston, and there was this new method of teaching reading, where they were going to teach the kids to memorize whole words as if the whole word itself was a symbol rather than the letters. So, you know, many of us probably read, learned to read the correct way. We learned that, you know, a letter T sounds like T, and when you combine it with an O, it sounds like two or toe, right? So, so that's how you learn how to read. We have a phonetic alphabet, and so logically, you need to understand phonics so that you could learn how to read. But this new method, and it was developed with the best of intentions by a reverend, he wanted to teach deaf children to read. So deaf children can't hear sounds, so he said, well, hey, I'll just teach them the whole word. They'll memorize the whole word. So we'll put, you know, cat up there. You see it in the little book there. He's got cat or fish or whatever, and we'll show him this, uh, this uh, series of squiggly lines means fish. And, you know, for deaf children, this was a big improvement. Before they couldn't read anything, now they can read things. But when you apply it to children who can hear sounds, well, you know, it doesn't work that well. We have so much evidence of this. So in China, you know, that's the way you learn because that's their writing system. They have a symbol and the symbol represents a thought or an idea or a word or an action. And so that's how you would teach reading in China. But we have a phonetic alphabet. It's a totally different system. And so when you try to use this whole, they call it the whole word method, the look-say method, the sight method, all these different terms to conceal the quackery, it causes incredible damage. Some people can still learn to read like this, not very well, you know, you, you'll never be an expert reader. If you come to words that you've never memorized, it'll be, hmm, that's a struggle, what does that mean? You have to guess from the context, that's what they teach you to do. But this is incredibly, incredibly harmful. This is why we have the literacy crisis in our country. This produces dyslexia. Uh, this produces all the reading disability. You know, the kids that say, oh, you, your kid is just dumb. You need to put him in special education. No, it's because you taught him to read wrong, right? And so I'll show you guys at the end. This is exactly what Common Core calls for, even though this has been exposed as quackery since the 1840s, when Horace Mann tried it in the school in Boston. The schoolmasters, seven of them, came together and they said, this is idiocy, this is lunacy, it flies in the face of all logic, we're not going to do it anymore because the kids aren't learning to read. So it was exposed right at the beginning. And as we'll see, a guy who did not have the best of intentions brought it to all over the United States. And that is John Dewey. How many of you guys know of John Dewey? I mean, you've probably heard of him at least, right? If you go to Wikipedia, it calls him the, the founding father of progressive modern public education, right? So he is the founding father of our public school system. He is the man. Uh, he had a lot of money from the Rockefellers. Uh, you know, back in the day when millions of dollars were real money, the Rockefellers through the General Education Board gave him $3 million. They said, here, try out your kooky ideas and uh, let's see what happens. So they set up an experimental school. They, uh, they figured out that, uh, you know, we can do these different things and it'll reduce the literacy. And Go read John Dewey's own writings, because I don't want you to hear it from me. I want you to hear it from him. This guy was an avowed open socialist. His goal was to turn America into a communist society in which there was no private property, no God, no Christianity, none of it. And he said so openly. He didn't bother to hide this. This was an open secret. If anybody had just read what he had to say, they would have seen he went over to see what Lenin was up to, say, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, let's see if we can do that over here. And yeah, that was his ideology. He was a socialist. That little novel that you see there, uh, Looking Backward by Edward Bellamy. So that's a novel about a communist America in the year 2000. And he thought, hey, that's great. Let's try to go for that. And in fairness to him, you know, that was more than 100 years ago, and he didn't have the last 100 years that we have to look and say, whoa, that's, you know, atrocious, 100 million, 200 million dead people, why would we want to try that? So in fairness to him, you know, he might, you might say he might not have known what would have happened, but that was his goal anyways. He wanted to turn America into a socialist country, into a godless country, and he knew that the key to doing that was education. And of course, the Rockefellers liked that idea too, right? Have $3 million and see what you can do. He was also a humanist. He was one of the drafters and the signers of the first humanist manifesto. And don't let anybody tell you that the schools are secular, that there's no religion in the schools. There is absolutely religion in the schools. It's the religion of humanism. The courts have found religion to be humanism, and it is very much a religious faith. So, you know, what's the first words in the humanist manifesto that John Dewey came up with? So we believe the universe is eternally self-existing and not created. So those of you who've read your Bibles, you know, the very first page, in the beginning, who created God created, right? It's not eternally self-existing, and it certainly is created. So there's this fundamental conflict in worldview between the guy who founded our so-called public schools and the view of the overwhelming majority of Americans at that time. You know, th this view would have been dismissed as absolutely kooky at the time. What did our founders say when they wrote the Declaration of Independence? It's self-evidently true. We don't even have to talk about it. It's so obvious, it's self-evident that we're all created equal, that we're all endowed by our creator with inalienable rights. Is that a religious statement? No, of course not. It's a self-evident truth. 
and yet they tell the teachers, you can't talk about that. That's religious, right? Because you can't have a creator in the schools. So instead, we'll teach the religion of humanism, that we all evolved from slime that turned into monkeys, and that our life has no more value than a goldfish, that morality does not exist. It's a social construct, right? You can kill if, unless the majority thinks killing is wrong, in which case maybe killing is wrong. We'll have to have a discussion. But there's no morals. There's no values. It's just we decide everything, right? And our lives are worthless anyways, right? That's how these people can go out and mass murder. Say, oh, your life is no more important than your pet cat. And that's why the kids will go and kill themselves, right? That's why we have an epidemic of suicide in the schools. They are indoctrinating the children with a very harmful, very false, objectively false religion. I mean, the founder said it was self-evidently true that we're created. And here they are teaching this humanism that we're not created. And if you read the rest of the humanist declaration, you'll see that they wanted to abolish private property. They wanted to abolish the nation state. Does all this sound familiar? Okay, good. So that's where it comes from. Right, that's how we got to this point. That's why our 15-year-olds are out there protesting in the street about that we want uh, you know, Paris Agreement, we want you know, all this. This is where it comes from. So um, we could talk a long time about John Dewey, but clearly his views were absolutely incompatible with those of the founders of America, with those of even still today probably most Americans. Right? Most Americans today call themselves Christians. Most Americans have some nebulous idea that you know, we appreciate our rights and you know, our rights maybe come from God. Uh, they've tried to get rid of that, but, you know, it's still out there. So this is the source of so much of this. Now, for those of you who are Christians, what does the Bible say about education? A lot, actually, and I encourage you to check this out. But here's some that I thought were really important. It says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if you take that out of the schools, what are you building on? A foundation of nothingness, of lies, of stupidity. And this is what they've done. That's how they can promote all this quackery in the schools and get away with it. The kids don't know any better. You know, they, they, you tell them, oh, you've got to listen to your teacher. Your teacher knows what they're talking about. The teacher got brainwashed too. So did the parents. So, you know, we're all in this boat together. And I'm, I'm not going to say that I'm any better. We've all had this indoctrination. We all suffer from this today. You know, unless you live in a, in a bubble, we've all been influenced by these ideas. And our worldview certainly reflects some of this. But uh, it's very different than what the founders had in mind. It's very different than what the people who came to settle America had in mind. You know, go read the Mayflower Compact. Why did they come here? Right? To build a kingdom, to advance the kingdom of God. So totally different than what uh, the schools are doing today. Uh, John Dewey was also, I put educator in quotes. So, you know, it's totally ridiculous, this idea that he was an educator. He liked to pretend to be an educator. And he got a nice job at uh, Columbia University teaching future educators. And so that's how they really promoted this quackery across the nation. They took over the teaching schools so that they could train all the teachers who would then go out and brainwash all the kids. Very, very clever strategy. And with Rockefeller money, you can do a lot. The Dewey Plan. He outlined this very clearly. We actually republished uh, one of his essays in the book because it's just so revealing. He says that we have to do this quietly. Nobody can see what we're doing because if parents figure out and teachers figure out, there would be a revolution, right? Our whole plan would be in jeopardy. So he wrote this in his own essay. It's called Primary Education Fetish. Read it for yourself. He thought education should be about socializing the children, right? Where have you heard that before? You've got to socialize the kids so that they'll be good socialists, right? So that's the purpose of pseudo-education, of what John Dewey built in America. So... The Dewey plan was promote this quackery, reduce the literacy of the American people by promoting this whole word method, reduce the faith of the American people. I mean, the whole idea, right? If our rights don't come from God, what's left? Nothing, right? They come from government. Government can take them away. We'll be a democracy and we can vote ourselves our rights away. So he needed to go for those two things. And they knew that they could never impose tyranny and globalism and socialism on a people who were literate, who knew their Bibles, who were Christian, who believed in the self-evident truth that all men are created equal and that our rights come from our creator, they could never do it. And so they had to attack those things. And that's what the schools are doing to this day. And every generation, it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse to the point where they're literally, as Holly explained yesterday, teaching open communism in the schools today. So again, this stuff has been exposed so many times. I, I'm not telling you guys any, any new discovery. This stuff has been known since the 1840s. If you want to read an incredibly damning indictment of this quack reading method, go back and read the essay that the Boston Schoolmasters wrote. Um, Rudolf Flesch warned us about this in the 1950s, why Johnny can't read. Some of you guys might have heard of that, or maybe your parents. Uh, and then your parents said, oh, goodness, we better start teaching uh, Johnny phonics, right? And so that's why a lot of us today can read, because this information came out. Then Dr. Blumenfeld came along, picked up there. He broke down all the books that they were using in the government schools to accomplish this. 
Dick and Jane readers, for example, developed by Dewey and company, and uh, he exposed exactly how this damages the brain. Today, and let me see if we have time to talk about it, modern neuroscience confirms all this. It's amazing. We can see a brain scan, and we can see the incredible damage that this quackery does to these poor children. Neuroscience exposes Dewey's quackery. This is really amazing. And uh, so the, the doctor who uh, found these things, he's a progressive. You know, he doesn't believe necessarily in our worldview. But he said, they look at the brain damage that this is doing to the children. The whole word language does not work. That's not how our writing system works. That's not how our brain is designed. It just doesn't work. That's why 55% of Americans today, probably worse, can barely read if they can read at all. That's why nobody reads the Bible. Nobody reads books. Nobody reads anything. We all watch TV, right? We all watch the boob tube. And that's exactly what they want. So this is no accident, right? It, it, they can't say, oh, we didn't know that it caused this. Of course they knew. They had to have known. This has been exposed so many times, and yet they keep doing it, which suggests very strongly, I would argue, that it's on purpose. This is deliberate. They've done it deliberately. Uh, so we still have sight words in the classroom today all over this country. If you read the Common Core Standards right away in kindergarten, right, the poor little kids, they get them memorizing sight words. They send them home to you, to the parents, with a flashcard. So memorize all these words, right? Uh, dog, cat, she, he. Probably some of you guys remember this from your own kids, right? You send them to kindergarten, they came home with these flashcards. They're supposed to memorize the words that did huge amounts of damage to the overwhelming majority of those kids, unless the parents had already, you know, cut this off at the past by teaching the kids phonics. And I tell parents, you know, if nothing else, if you don't do anything else for your kids ever, teach them phonics, because then they can educate themselves. If they know how to read, they can read anything, right? All the information that mankind has produced is accessible at their fingertips. So, so much there. Here's a list of sight words that they use in kindergarten, just a, a little display there. You can see what it looks like. So there's a list of words they're supposed to remember. Feds in the classroom, right? We all know feds don't belong in the classroom. Tenth Amendment prohibits it. But you guys remember the Supreme Court came out in the 60s, right? We were already super dumbed down. This had been going on for generations. They said, oh, you can't pray in the schools. You can't have a Bible in the schools. Do you guys know why the first public schools were established in America? To teach reading so the kids could learn the Bible. The very first education act in the new continent of America, 1647, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It was called the Old Deluder Satan Act. They said all the kids have to know how to read because they have to know scripture, because if they don't know scripture, the devil will mislead them and then they'll fall off into wickedness, tyranny, ignorance, etc. So that's why we have public schools. The founders said, of course, religion has to be part of education. So I'm not saying, you know, we need schools to teach Seventh-day Adventism or Catholicism or something like that. But to take out the biblical foundation of Western civilization, the concept of self-evident truth, that all men are created with rights, to take this out of the classroom, you destroy the nation. And that is the agenda. So feds in the classroom, you guys all know Jimmy Carter. Uh, he set up the Department of Education with help from Congress. It's been all downhill from there. It wasn't great before, but it, the downhill descent has accelerated since we got this abomination. The road to national standards. Thank you, Clinton. Thank you, Bush. Thanks to all the rest of them. Common Core, I, you know, you guys have probably heard about Common Core. Even the experts that they put on the committee to review these, the hand-picked experts said, this is disastrous. It's based on incorrect math. It takes all the good literacy out. We're not going to do this. So this is a disaster on steroids. Science and history, same thing going on. They got uh, the next generation science standards. That sounds really modern, right? Made by the same Common Core people, Bilderbergers, Council on Foreign Relation guys, trilateralists. These are the guys behind Achieve Inc., which produced these with help from the federal government and the state governments. Their goal is to indoctrinate the kids and dumb down the kids. And we could you know, talk about this forever. UNESCO, they're taking it global now, right? They want a global education system to dumb down and indoctrinate all of humanity with the same quackery. They're very open about it. You can go to UNESCO's website. You can read their reports. They'll tell you exactly what they're doing. They'll tell you that four-year-olds need to learn about things that I can't even talk about in their sex education program. They'll tell you that 12-year-olds need to know how to lobby and ad advocate for legal, safe abortions. Right? So they're not messing around here. They'll tell you that reading teachers all over the world need to use this quack whole word method. Right? They got a nice report about how we need to all be using this all over the world. So it's no surprise. Arne Duncan, Obama's education secretary, said UNESCO was his partner. Right? Isn't that interesting? You can bet 
that uh, this is a global plan. They even have a world core curriculum. It was dedicated to Alice Bailey, the founder of the Lucifer Publishing Company. You can go to UNESCO's website. You can read it yourself. It's all very interesting. You know, it's a very clearly socialist, globalist, humanist indoctrination. They don't bother to hide it. They've got the values clarification where they teach, you know, they use these disgustingly deceptive exercises. They'll say, well, there's eight of you in a life raft and the life raft can only hold seven. There's a doctor, a lawyer, an Indian chief, a pastor. Who are you going to throw overboard? Obama. <laughs> right, there you go. I love it. But um, you know, the real answer is we're not going to kill anybody. Why should we kill people? You know, one guy can swim behind the boat for an hour, and then we'll switch places. You know, we don't have to kill people. But this is what they're teaching the kids because they want to bypass the morality that you taught them. Killing is wrong, right? Stealing is wrong. No, it's not. Not according to these people. There's no morals. That would imply that there's a God who created morals and moral laws. So they got to get rid of all that. So they have these values, clarifications. Things. Look into this. I mean, just look at the stuff that they're doing with these values, clarifications. This is why the kids think morality is subjective, that they can do anything they want and there's no problem with it. The UN has a global action plan on education. Go read it. It will blow your mind. They openly tell you that they want to change the values, the beliefs, the behavior of your children. They don't even use you know, words to hide it. Those are the words they use. They want to change the values, the beliefs, the attitudes, and the behavior of your children, and they tell you openly. Education for sustainable development. You know That was Holly's topic yesterday. It is so important that people understand this. They actually tell you in one of their reports that people who are more highly educated are not sustainable. Right? They're less sustainable than dumb, dumbed down, people who can't make a living and won't consume resources, therefore. I'm already over my time, but uh, I just want to say, you know, this battle, in my opinion, you know, everybody has their own pet issue. In my opinion, if we lose this, all the rest is for nothing because they've got, you know, Holly said, almost 90% of the kids in these institutions. If we lose this battle, it's all over. You know, we might have another 20 years, maybe even 50 if we're lucky, but long term, you know, they, the study from the Nehemiah Institute came out. 80% of Christian children who go into the government schools will leave the church. So if you're a Christian, that should alarm you. It's very scientific. It's, you know, they've been working on this for a long time. They know what they're doing. It's all part of the plan. So I would submit that if you have children in your life that you love, whether they're grandchildren or your own children or your nieces or your nephews or, you know, your neighbor's kids that you like, do what you can to protect them. And I would submit to you that that means getting them out of these institutions immediately. If you can homeschool them, awesome. If you can't, find a good private school, a good Christian school. Uh, I actually work for the Freedom Project Academy. I'm not here to advertise that, but it's an online school. It's very affordable. So if you're a parent who doesn't feel like you can homeschool yourself, there's a lot of options like that. Everybody can do it. And you'll say, oh, but then we'll have to give up our vacation or our car. Well, what's more important to you? Your children or a second car or an extra vacation? So... Thanks, guys. I really appreciate being able to speak to you guys, and God bless America.